Robin Lee, how's the um, hey, how's it going? How's the MCO treating you, brother? It's good. You know, I've had plenty of time to reflect about life, love, death, and the virus. Oh, <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot of navel gazing, brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, why is gold going crazy? Um, well, I think I think there are a number of nuances to it. So. At a kind of, sort of fundamental level, gold is going crazy because of a flight to safe haven, um, as you would expect in any crisis. Specifically, at this point in time, uh, it's going crazy because you have a crisis of confidence in the financial markets, plus the effects of the pandemic, which has shut down uh, movement. Um, just to put into a perspective, in the great financial crisis of 2008, 2009, you didn't see this disconnect between the physical and the financial markets because you could move the metal around from London to New York, from Tokyo to Singapore, from Hong Kong to Singapore. What you're seeing now, and actually we saw this, we started to see this about three, four weeks ago, is that the physical started to see a premium against the global spot price because we were literally running out of stock in Singapore. There wasn't enough kilo bars in Singapore. Um, so and so what people I are heard, basically buying physical gold, not, not trading it on computers anymore. Well, yeah, because in times of crisis, people, you know, some people may not trust financial institutions they, for all kinds of reasons. They want to put their hands on physical. And that's usually not a problem. So, for example, right, you can move any amount of gold you want from the Hong Kong market to Singapore within four hours, within the same day. So you can place an order and you know that you're good for delivery, even if there's not enough stock in Singapore. But in this crisis, at this moment, because flights are being canceled and there are not that many planes available and therefore cargo capacity is limited and you're fighting for capacity between food supply, gold and what have you, uh, you, have, you may have enough gold in Hong Kong, you may have, not, you may have enough gold in Tokyo that would ordinarily would be able to make its way to Singapore, but it can't get on the plane. So you have that problem um, at a kind of physical, uh, simple level. Then you overlay that with what's happening in Europe where most of the major refineries are and where they kind of create new, new gold bars, right? So what I just described was existing gold bars in the marketplace. Then the refineries produce new gold bars from uh, uh, unrefined gold to refined gold. Now, they can't get supply of the unrefined gold, the dore, into their factories because of the planes. And now with the lockdown, they, even if they were able to get the dore in, they're running at low capacity because they don't have the manpower because everyone's you know, uh, uh, safely tucked away in their own apartment or house. So they don't have enough people to, to manufacture these bars. And then even if they're able to manufacture the bars, you don't have the planes to them ship. Um, yeah. What does that mean? It's going to go crazy? The prices are going to go nuts? Because it's what, 1,700 bucks an ounce now? Well, the, you have, you have the, that's the spot price. Though. And then you have the premium associated with physical. So that's a dislocation between uh, the spot, global spot price and gold if you were to walk into a shop today and ask for uh, a physical kilo bar. So you're seeing a, a premium of about 10% right now, five to 10%, which is unusual. Um, but it typically happens when there's a shortage of supply or physical in a marketplace. And over and above that, what has happened in the last two weeks is because of this problem of folks not being able to move metal from one place to another, specifically the London market to the New York market, where co the COMEX contracts are traded and settled, um, you have a problem of all these derivatives contracts needing fiscal settlement and not enough metal in New York. So for a brief period of time uh, this last week, there was a concern that a number of the major bullion traders and banks were gonna be on the wrong side of a failed trade. And actually this week, uh, the regulators, COMEX and the major bullion banks came together and tried to fix that problem by allowing all kinds of gold to be used for physical settlement rather than the 100 ounce bar, 100 ounce bar which is typically the contract size for the COMEX contract. So yeah, you have all kinds of stuff happening that is frankly unprecedented because in previous financial crises, it was just a crisis, it was just a financial crisis, planes still moved around. 
So, so the long and short of it, Robin, is that um, are the prices going to go crazy? Should people buy buying gold now? Um, where where well, where is the advice? So I, I think I mean I, I, this is my view of the world, right? I look at it, there are three potential outcomes. One is that this uh, the, the the pandemic uh, stops at some point in time, and everything returns to normal. Your typical V-shaped recovery and everything goes back to normal. The other one is that this is like a, the great financial crisis, the 2008 all over again. And the worst case is, let's call it great financial crisis plus plus, whatever plus plus means. Um, I think the odds for a V-shaped recovery are, are, are getting longer and therefore less likely. I think uh, the odds of a typical financial crisis also getting longer, I think the uh, the prospects of a, a great financial crisis plus plus is getting shorter. I mean, I'm not going to put some probability around that. And so I think that is going to augur well for gold uh, under these set of circumstances, primarily because um, what we discussed the last time, you know, the, the, the appetite for global coordination is less because of uh, what is happening out of the U.S. and the noise coming out of the U.S., what's happening in Europe with the, the governments that are kind of more inward looking. So I think people are, governments and policymakers are less likely to try and create a coordinated response. And the second thing, which is more short term, is that uh, a lot of the things that are being put in place, are uh, the same tools that were used for the last crisis, um, and not necessarily the tools that are gonna resolve this crisis, you know, because you can stimulate the economy as much as you want, but if people are still fearful of stepping out of their house, they're not going to spend. Uh, if companies are fearful of, of not having customers and of the pandemic, they're not going to spend. So no amount of stimulus will kind of jumpstart the economy. And that's my greatest concern is that a lot of the stuff that you hear from, from policymakers tend to be overweight on trying to solve a financial markets problem rather than the uh, the medical pandemic problem and actually the, the man in the street problem. Okay, so um, the second part, right? Um, is there a solution in terms of, what, uh, do you have any suggested remedies? Well, I mean, I, I think obviously the, the, the first one is get this thing under control, right? Uh, but in the short run, uh, cash is king, right? And people are gonna be laid off, not just in Malaysia, but everywhere around the world. I think the idea of universal basic income uh, could potentially be the difference between someone uh, uh, missing a payment, not getting medical treatment, um, emergencies. And you know, if, if ever there was a time to try and experiment on universal basic income, it would be now, right? To give, you know, to borrow Andrew Yang's uh, uh, playbook, you know, a thousand dollars a month, or in this case, a thousand ringgit a month. Um, and you can expand on that, right? Because now's the time for folks to think about their civic responsibilities, right? Uh, and to, to, to encourage them to, to be part of civil society. So you create, for example, a uh, thousand ringgit a month basic allowance, but it, it gets augmented by your participation in civil society. When you vote, you get something. When you participate in your town hall, uh, in your community, whether it's to clear up uh, the parts, you know, uh, vote on, on projects, you get something, um, then I think you have a way of augmenting the universal basic, basic income and still serve good in society and still also uh, help people uh, prepare for a time when automation comes in, which is the other problem, the longer term problem that we face. And you also mentioned as a way of um, using the country's natural resources um, to raise money from <laughs> from specifically the Western uh, economies. Yes. So um, yeah, this this demonstrates how much navel gazing I've actually done. Um, <laughs> so w one theoretical uh, solution, given the, the the situation in the country with regards to our public finances is that we need to create wealth out of, frankly, nothing, right? Because um, we can only borrow so much. Um, if the West and the world in large, in general, 
believes in the need to save the environment and protect what we have, then one resource that we do have that we never plan to monetize is our natural reserves, our natural forest reserves. If we can use that as a form of collateral to back a green sukuk, for example, uh, and the, the quid pro quo is that the green sukuk uh, has a, a Shara compliant coupon that is pegged not to our sovereign, current sovereign rating, but to say the US treasuries, you immediately lower our cost of financing by a significant amount. And, and the collateralization can be such that we need to protect these reserves for, from not just illegal logging, but any logging whatsoever. So no more logging, concessions, etc. And in the event that we break uh, the covenant, uh, the default isn't that you know we have to pay back, but we actually uh, default the land to a trust, a sort of multilateral international trust that will look after it. So that will give us the incentive to make sure that we don't give up sovereignty over the natural forest reserves, but also gives investors the comfort that we have skin in the game. So it is only very theoretical. <laughs> but nevertheless, it holds water. So um, I think we've only been in the, uh, the movement control order for the last, what is it, 10 days, and you've done this amount of naval gazing. I think if I call you this time next week, you're going to have the solution um, to, to cancer <laughs> and the world's world. Uh, yeah, <laughs> All right, Robin, take care, man. Thank you very much. All right, take care. Stay safe. Have a good Take care, brother. Bye. All right.